Hi there. So today I'm going to be doing a review of Roosh V's book called Lady. So Roosh V, uh, I'm sure you probably are all well aware of him. He's a content creator and an author. He is most well known, I think, for his pickup artist uh, type books and teaching men how to embrace their masculinity, um, to not be afraid of approaching girls, and um, how to kind of pick up girls for one night stands. The, the, this is kind of his, that, that's sort of what he focused his earlier uh, books and content on, but he seems to have gone through a little bit of a change where maybe he himself has realized that the pickup artist lifestyle or focusing on engaging with women in that way has not yielded the long-term positive outcomes that he wanted or maybe he didn't even consider what the long-term outcomes of you know being a pickup artist or you know just sort of engaging with women in a one-night stand type of way um, would be and now that he has realized that he's uh, he's almost 40 and is single um, he's he has rethought that method I think a little bit and so as a result he has he's he's written two books um, recently in the past year or so one is called game and the other one is lady so game is kind of instead of instead of teaching men just how to pick up women in the club um he has tried to make a case for um how to entice a woman engage a woman romantically um, and build a deep, intimate connection with them that can be long-lasting. And it's my understanding that Lady is sort of the companion piece to that for women. Now, I haven't read Game. I actually haven't read any book by Roosh except for Lady. And um, unfortunately, in this review, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna give you any quotes because uh, I received this book from Roosh to review, um, and it was the sort of link that he gave me, I think it expires because, you know, I didn't actually purchase the book. And so I, I don't actually have real quotes, but what I do have is my analysis of what's in that book. And um, before I start, I would just like to say that I really enjoyed reading this book. Um, I didn't agree with everything in it and we'll get into that, but in general, on the whole, I think that this is a really helpful book for young women. I wish that I had found this book when I was in my early 20s or even my late teenage years. Uh, there were there were certain things that Roosh elaborated on with regard to female psychology that I felt gave me a greater understanding of myself and of my past choices, my past mistakes. Um, and had I known these things or had heard these things previously, I may have been less likely to do those things. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a link in the description to purchase the book from Roosh's website. Um, I'd highly recommend it. So let's, let's get into the book itself. Uh, the book is divided up into a few different parts and Roosh begins by talking about how, um, you know, we often look for our happiness externally. And I think a lot of women are very guilty of that. Women, you know, women are a huge, if not, I think they're the vast majority of the consumer market. And a lot of modern women um, are addicted to shopping, just to, to put it bluntly, we, we are. And even I have an element of, you know, retail therapy type behavior in my past. Um, and it's not helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't fill the hole inside of you. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't make you feel content. Um, that sort of emptiness, I think that the external search for happiness, um, is an attempt to fill is something that can really only be filled by genuine intimacy, uh, love, companionship, family. And so I think Roosh rightly identifies this sort of, 
um, external search for happiness, which I think is also related to the pickup artist type lifestyle, you know, the two or three different girls a week type lifestyle is, uh, it is an expression of this external search for happiness and trying to um, find contentment externally and then, you know, solve what is ultimately an internal problem. Now, the one thing that I would just personally add to that is that one good way of sort of undermining this behavior that I think we're all guilty of, men and women, in lots of different ways, is uh, to practice gratitude. And that goes for, you know, the gratitude that you have for the belongings that you own, as well as the partner that you might currently have. Um, I think a lot of women tend to see the men that they are with through a filter of comparison to other men or to what they what other women have and that I think triggers what's called hypergamy where um, there is this element of female psychology where women try to um, upgrade their boyfriends or their husbands in a way that um, women don't really uh, leave a guy. Well, some women do, of course, leave men for the problems that are in that specific relationship, but it is a common occurrence that women tend to leave men that they are with for men who are who they perceive as being better or having higher status or being able to offer them more resources. So I think practicing gratitude for the, the man you may be with, if you are lucky enough to have you know a good man, um, and practicing gratitude for what you have on a daily basis can undermine this external search for happiness. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm just, I have notes here, so that's why I'm looking down a lot. <laughs> Um, there was a really, uh, cute kind of thing that Rouge said in the book that, uh, you know, we, we as women can have in our minds, um, if we're, if we're going to do something and we're not sure about whether or not it's a good thing to do, we can ask ourselves, what, what would grandma do? <laughs> and I think this is, it's really cute and it's really, it's really actually effective. It's a good thing to, to think about this. Not all of us are lucky enough to have... Um, our grandmas in our lives, but I do, and my grandma is from a completely different time, a different world, and there is a truth to looking at the old ways that, th that the, the way that men and women used to interact with one another that would have been more true back in your grandparents' day um, that can help guide you towards a more traditional um, way of making decisions in your life and determining whether or not this is going to be a good idea. If your grandmother wouldn't have done it, it's probably not a good idea for you to do it either. Um, another great point that Roosh brought up was that men, men, the pickup artist community and sort of what um, pickup artistry is sort of a response to is the sexual liberation of women. Women, sorry, Sirens, classic, just wait for those to pass. Okay, so the sexual liberation of women and the sort of emergence of, you know, don't slut shame, you know, women can have multiple sexual partners and uh, you have to still respect them as much as you would a woman who, you know, is, is very modest and doesn't do that. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having many, many, many casual sex partners. Um, that That's kind of what pickup artistry is um, a response to, I think. If women were signaling that you don't, you, you aren't going to um, have sex with me unless you're willing to commit and, um, you know, making men wait a long period of time so that there's an opportunity for an emotional bond to be established before you guys have sex, um, then men would be less likely to be kind of just 
I guess, seeing women as uh, the opportunity for a one night stand, um, or as Roosh likes to put it, a pump and dump, which I hate that term. He uses it constantly. And it's my understanding that he intentionally uses it that way to kind of make his readers, his female rate readers kind of like, um, a little disgusted, I suppose, with the act itself in an attempt to make them less likely to engage in that behavior or to find themselves in a situation where that could happen to them. I, I mean, I, I don't know if it's effective. I found it myself kind of like cringing a little bit every single time I heard it because it's just so, it's just so crude. But um, what he means, I think, is, you know, the one night stand thing. And so if women want men to commit to them, which is a common sort of grievance that you hear from women, you know, men won't commit, they're, they're all F word boys. And um, all they want to do is have a one night stand and not commit. Well, if you want men to step up to the plate and take the risk of commitment and marrying a woman nowadays is a risk for men. If, if you want men to offer that, you have to signal to them that you aren't the uh, one night stand type of girl and allow for a emotional bond to happen, you know, through dating and spending time together and learning about each other's personalities, learning about each other's quirks. Um, you need to allow that to happen before you're going to get on a larger scale men will be, be being willing to wait. And I thought that was just a really, I just thought that was a really, really good point. Um, so Roosh kind of says, uh, women must signal that they want husbands and fathers. Um, if, the, if they keep giving away sex for nothing, m men will not change. And I think I think that's a really uh, a really good point that women women don't want to take responsibility for what they have uh, contributed to this breakdown in dynamic between men and women. Uh, men will offer families for sex, but women must be willing. Uh, <laughs> men men will uh, men will offer families for sex but women must stop being whores. <laughs> uh, I think that's a direct quote. Um, so the next point that Roosh makes is how feminism kind of undermines the true empowerment of women by uh, forcing women to compete on the same time frame as men. Now, anybody who's even remotely familiar with biology knows that Women have a smaller, a shorter period of fertility uh, than men do. Women are only really fertile until a maximum of 40 years old. And there is a sharp drop in fertility at the age of 35. It becomes much more difficult for women to get pregnant. As well as a less significant but real drop at the age of 30. And so women kind of really need to have, if they want families, if a woman is the kind of person who wants to have children and wants to have families, you really want to have a uh, strong relationship with a man established early on in life, uh, who you can trust, who wants to have children with you and is willing to help you uh, build a family. If a man wants to do that, I mean, men are kind of fertile well into their 50s and 60s. There are men that can have, that have been known to have children in their 70s. And so there isn't this kind of bio, the biological clock is what people normally call it. You know, women's biological clocks start ticking. And so because women are on a different biological time scale with regard to families, it's unfair to make them compete in terms of getting their education and their careers sorted on the same time frame as men. Women, if they want to have families, it makes a lot more sense for them to establish their relationship, get their family sorted um, within maybe the ages of 20 to 30, maybe even 35. Um, once those things are sorted, you know, it does make sense for women to stay at home and raise their children by every metric 
children who have stay-at-home moms or homeschooled um, are homeschooled are, are, are much, much healthier, they're happier uh, mentally, and uh, they tend to do a lot better than kids who go to public school. And so, yes, a woman may have to sacrifice the first 20, or maybe not 20, at the first between 15 years, you know, of adulthood, um, being devoted to her family and raising her family, if that is what she wants. And then once the kids are grown, you know, kids grow up and then they can take care of themselves and then they leave the nest at, you know, 18, 19, hopefully. And so then, I mean, theoretically, let's say a woman has her first child at, you know, 20. By the time she's 40, her children have flown the coop. And now she has the entire rest of her life. You know, there's a lot, like people live to be in their 80s. She has 40 years to go to school, to start working on her education, to, um, you know, get skill sets, work on a career. There's no reason why a woman in her 40s can't do that. Um, and the feminists and feminist ideology doesn't explain that clearly to women. They say, you know, you need, right out the gate of high school, you need to get your education, you need to get your career in order, you need to sacrifice all of your best childbearing years uh, to sort out and compete, sort out your career and compete with men. Um, and what ends up happening, and there are a lot of, there are a lot of resources online which, which prove this, is that many, many women who hit the wall, you know, around 30, 32, 33, and realize, you know, if I want to have kids, I need to do this now, um, they've, they've wasted so much time on things like, you know, climbing the corporate ladder or getting pieces of paper that say you're qualified to um, to talk about certain topics that don't actually bring them that much of an income. Um, they realize that the trade-off wasn't worth it and that they have sacrificed what I believe many women feel is the most important rite of passage in a woman's life, which is to be a mother and have children for material, external, status, you go girl type props, um, you know, competing with men in, in competitive corporate environments that doesn't normally bring women a lot of happiness. And it's a shame, it's a real shame. And the fact that Roosh highlights this, I think is actually something that shows he really does care about, you know, what happens to women. If if feminism was really about giving women options and telling them, you know, these are what your realistic options are, there would be some mention there of the fact that if you sacrifice uh, family life for your career, you know, and then you end up waiting too long and you can't have kids, you're going to have a really, really, really long, lonely life probably. And it's not, it's not fair to call that the empowerment of women. We should, if, if feminism was really about empowering women, we would, we would create the services and, and the setup for women who want to have families early in life during their best childbearing years, um, and then provi provide, provide what is necessary for them to, to pr pursue their education and their careers later in life. But of course, that's not what we see. Um, we see exactly the opposite. Um, so the next chapter is, uh, I think it's titled Men and Beauty Bait. Beauty Bait is a really, it's a really um, practical and helpful segment of the book. It kind from, it's, it's Roosh's personal opinion. Now, of course, you know, there will be men who have different personal preferences when it comes to how a woman looks, obviously. But I think the sort of, the things that Roosh outlines in his beauty bait portion are things which any woman can do to enhance her appearance. And I think for the most part, a lot of them are correct. Um, one of them is focusing on your hair, like growing your hair out um, as long as possible. And um, well, I, won't, I, won't, I won't spoil too many of them because they're really good, but I just personally wanted to add some of my own opinions about what 
uh, women can do to improve their their appearance and um, maybe entice men more to kind of approach them or to be attracted to them. Um, and just really quickly, I'll go through some of those. Um, A-line dresses, uh, midi length, are really, really flattering on pretty much all body types. They accentuate the smallest part of your body, which normally for most female body types is the waist. Um, even if uh, you know you do have a large midsection, because the A-line shape um, goes out a away from the body, it creates an hourglass shape, which um, I think there are many studies actually which have proven that that kind of shape is, in general, the it's it's what men are most attracted to. Um, Paint your nails, keep your nails like looking nice and well manicured. It's a really simple thing that anyone can do. Your hands, they say, are the first part of your body to age. So make sure you're moisturizing your skin and taking care of your skin, um, you know, quite diligently. I have a very strict skincare regime. Um, and, you know, I think, I think I'm kind of lucky, like, you know, I'm, I'm 30. So, and a lot of people say that I don't look 30. Uh, I don't know how much of what my skin type is related to like my genes, but I know that once I started doing a very regimented skincare, a skincare sort of thing in the morning and in the evening, my skin has improved dramatically. And I would recommend any woman getting a few, um, a few products, which maybe I'll do a video on that, uh, because it's, it's kind of become an obsession of mine a little bit, all the different little types of things that you can use to improve your skin. And I think that, you know, having nice skin and having clear skin, you know, not having a lot of wrinkles is, it's way better than, you know, plastering yourself full of makeup. That's just my personal opinion. Uh, not only like don't um, cut your hair, no, yeah, okay, some men like short hair, but in general, long hair just is really flattering on most people. Um, not only just like not cutting your hair, but don't dye it. I made this mistake and I bleached my hair and I lost a lot of hair when I bleached it and my hair became brittle and I had to cut it and I lost a lot of length. It was a massive uh, money pit. I lost a lot of money because I was constantly having to um, maintain the blonde and it was just, it was a nightmare and it wasn't worth it. I think that I look much better now with my natural color and I think most women look better with their natural color. Um, now there was one part of the uh, beauty bait part that I wasn't super on board with. Uh, it was about eating less. So Rouge says that, you know, he does intermittent fasting and you can eat, pardon me, nose is a little runny say. Um, he says, you know, you can eat whatever you want as long as you're doing intermittent fasting and you kind of like low key starve yourself for generally like 16 hours to 18 hours a day. Like that's fine. Intermittent fasting is really good for you. I'm actually doing it right now for Lent, but eating whatever you want and just eating less of it is not actually good advice in my opinion. I think a high protein, low carb diet, not zero carb, but low carbs and unrefined whole foods. Um, unprocessed whole foods, organic if possible, is the best way to, um, you know, have your diet be something that is going to be reflective of attractiveness and of health. Um, also, you know, working out is, um, Roosh is really against women who lift weights because he says it makes them masculine. Um, I personally disagree with that. I think that, um, you know, of course, if you take anything to an extreme, it's not going to really yield great results, but like I lift weights. So, and, and I think I'm really feminine and I look feminine and I think I have a very feminine body. I don't have a masculine body, but no one would think that I have a masculine body. I don't think. Um, and I lift weights. Like I do deadlifts, I do squats, I do like everything that my boyfriend basically does. And it has not made my body more masculine. If anything, it has made my body more feminine. So it's about knowing what exercises are right for your body and choosing the body type that you want and then um, doing the exercises that will give you that body. Um, you know, yeah, that's all I'll say about that. So um, the next portion is like a men part two. And he, so this is the part of the book that I had the most 
of an issue with, to be totally honest, because Rouge says that women need to uh, make themselves sort of appear vulnerable or approachable in public. And I don't know how much of this was really like, is he just trying to make it easier for himself to like snag a woman in public? <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't want to like call him out or anything, but it seems to me that he was, he, he approached this part of the, uh, the book from more his own perspective on making women more attainable than what it actually feels like to be a woman uh, who is approached by a man in public. Personally, like I'm from a small town. I am not used to stranger strangers like approaching me um, really, you know, it's happened to me and I've like really floundered and not really known how to deal with the situation because I tend to be very polite and agreeable, which isn't really ideal for trying to uh, be direct and um, explaining to someone who has approached you in public that you are not interested in speaking to them and, to, and that you want them to leave you alone. There's also the element of, you know, women feel scared sometimes to reject strange men in public. They don't know how the man is going to react. Uh, they don't know if the man is going to react violently. They don't know if the man is going to follow them home. They don't know. It's a really, it's a really like stressful thing, I think, that strange men sometimes just approach you in public and then you know there's there's there seems to be no effective way to safely eject yourself from that situation so i personally don't think that like women making themselves appear vulnerable in public is smart especially depending on where you live um men are different in different places i'll just i'll just put it that way the way that north american men treat women in public is very different than the way men the way men treat women in other countries i'll just i'll just put it that way um and sure like if i was in canada um or some places in the united states i would feel more comfortable being vulnerable um and being polite and having a chat with a stranger but there are many places in europe like even in the current city that i'm living in where i would not be comfortable doing that and it would not be advised it would be um very it would not be safe to do that. And so his analogy of kind of like this predator prey scenario, you know, where the man kind of hunts the woman, I think a lot of women will roll their eyes at that and just kind of be like, like no woman really wants to be prey when we're talking about stranger in public interaction. I think it makes more sense to kind of allow women to feel kind of like flowers and you know the man can be the bee and the woman attracts you know a a man who she uh who she could be compatible with as opposed to this predator prey kind of you know make yourself vulnerable um scenario that he talks about he does mention that there are other ways that you can meet you know people which i would be more personally in favor of supporting like joining a political group going to church book clubs volunteering going to town barbecues book swaps um civic celebrations farmers markets um all of these would be more ideal, you know, than just like planting yourself somewhere in public and like looking innocent and doe-eyed. Um, I think that attracts like dangerous people. I'm not, I wasn't into that part of it. Um, also, I personally think that, you know, having your family or friends helping you find a, find a potential partner is possibly the best. And he does mention that. Um, so... I think there was one thing, I'm not sure if this was something that he mentioned or if this was something that I was kind of like, it's important for women to, to know this. Um, women should know how to green light a man without sleeping with him. And I think that a lot of women don't really know how to do that. Um, you know, playing with your hair, you know, and smiling and giggling and offering compliments and being polite, um, you know, grasping the man's arm when you walk across the street, um, you know, 
asking questions, you know, asking questions that, you know, you can allow him to enlighten you on something that you maybe you don't know. And you can honor that kind of like dominant submissive role between you. All of those things um, are like sort of modest ways to flirt and let a man know that just because you're not sleeping with him right away doesn't mean that, you know, he should just give up and move on to some other girl, but you, you're just, you know, you have self-respect and you, you don't just give it away to anyone. And so it's worth the wait and it keeps him, it keeps him knowing that, you know, potentially, eventually there will be um, a greater degree of intimacy between you. Um, so I'm going to leave it off there. I don't want this to be too long. It's already a half hour long, but ultimately this was a, a really good book. And I think that, um, oh, one more thing that I wanted to actually say that I thought was really good. Um, there was a part where he talks about why women like jerks and how women will oftentimes encounter a man who's like kind of mean to her and she'll be attracted to that because she wrongly identifies that sort of like aloofness as him being better than her or having higher status. Um, and it sort of triggers this kind of desire to um, get him to like you or to get him to treat you nice. And oftentimes um, you just end up with a jerk who doesn't treat you right. And this has happened to me in the past and I've never really known why I've been attracted to, peop to men who you know, aren't really nice. Uh, they're, they're not good people um, in the past. And I think that that explanation makes a lot of sense. And so um, another really good piece of advice that he offered was that, you know, like if a guy, you know, if you're, if you're into him or you're attracted to him because he's treating you not well, like he's treating you poorly, um, and he seems like kind of like an exciting bad boy, Th that is generally not the kind of guy who's going to wife you up and it's not normally the type of guy who's going to be willing to settle down with you and you know start a family that's true to my experience and i think a lot of women could probably relate to that and i think i thought that was really good advice too so um thank you for listening to my review of lady by roosh v um thank you to roosh if he ever sees this video for writing the book i found it quite helpful um, as I said before, anybody who's interested in purchasing the book, there will be a link in the description below. And I hope everyone has a great Monday and a great week. And take care. Till next time. Bye.